So are you all ready to take a journey? Well, it's fun. We've been on this journey for a while now. Um, automated infrastructure can be extremely empowering to your engineers, and it can also deliver value to your clients faster. And so before we start, I'm going to talk about who we are a little bit. And so Evestment is a NASDAQ company. Uh, they owned us for about two years now. Um, why we looked appealing to NASDAQ is we're a massive financial database that allows them, or that brings together consultants, investors, and managers, and it allows them to make data-driven decisions using our analytics, market intelligence, and all of the other features we build on top of that data set. And so to kind of put that in perspective, if I was to add up all of our uh, clients' AUM, which is assets under management, it'd be about $68 trillion. And so it's a little bit more than my personal portfolio, or, or maybe yours. And so with that, we need to constantly deliver them value, modernize our application and our stack, and continue to, to deliver that value. And so to put a little context around that, this is our stack. So we started with the monolith, and we moved to microservice architecture. And so with that move, we needed to do a little bit of retooling. And so at the UI layer, we went from ext.js, which is a huge JavaScript framework, and we wanted to move to a more modular-based framework. And so with that, we audited the top three, uh, React, Angular, and Vue.js. And we ended up landing on Vue. Uh, we just felt it pulled um, a lot of the good things from each and uh, without all the baggage. And so with that, the really important thing there is we were able to build components with Vue that you can mount in any framework. And so now it's huge because we don't have to go rewrite our entire UI layer um, from ext over to Vue. We can just mount any new component into ext when we need to. And so what powers the front end is our API layer, which we're a .NET shop. And so C Sharp is our main language. And the main difference here between the old and the new was we swapped from uh, .NET framework to .NET core. And we did this for a lot of reasons. And the main one that we'll, you'll kind of get today is because .NET core can run uh, on any OS. And so what we do with our APIs now is we package them in Docker containers running on a Linux uh, image using Alpine, which was one of the thinner flavors of Linux. And all of that is deployed and orchestrated in AWS ECS, so Elastic Container Service. And so with that, that kind of takes us to our next layer, which is infrastructure. And we were in a massive uh, data center before that, running a bunch of VMs. Um, and then we made the move to AWS. And at that point, we really only had a few uh, data sources at, at our fingertips, which was a managed Elasticsearch cluster, which we've been on since V1, and uh, Microsoft SQL. And so with the move to AWS, we now have RDS or DynamoDB or DocumentDB or any of those things that AWS offers us. And so how do we get those resources out into all of our environments. And so we started down the path of Chef with EC2s. Uh, and like I said, we decided to go Docker. And so we changed over there. We also implemented infrastructure as code with Terraform. And you're going to hear a lot about that today. And then our CI pipeline was Team City, which was getting expensive. Uh, every agent cost more money. Um, it was harder to scale. So we made the swap over to Jenkins. And we're running those on EC2s, and we're auto-scaling them. Uh, so the more code that the devs are merging, it'll auto-scale up and then back down. And so a couple of the tools that we use uh, in the stack are obviously Visual Studio, which is now in 2019 for our IDE. But that's now almost made it to where we only use it in the API layer. And for all the other layers, we're using Visual Studio code. And if you haven't used that, you don't have to be a .NET shop to use it. It actually runs anywhere. Um, so Apple, Linux, uh, it's a really nice tool that Microsoft did a good job with. Uh, 
It has extensions, so we've got view extensions, Docker, Terraform. Uh, you can even run your terminal or PowerShell in there, so it's actually really nice if you want to check it out. And so I want to look at the migration to AWS, because that's really where it kicked off uh, our journey down the path of um, automated infrastructure. And so, like I said before, we went from this massive data center or managed solution uh, to the public cloud. And we chose AWS as our provider. And on this move, we knew we needed, not wanted, but we needed two things. The first thing is 100% infrastructure as code. So we didn't want to do a five-year plan or a 10-year plan where you do 10% and kind of move through the stages. We needed 100% infrastructure as code, which we used uh, Terraform. So why did we choose Terraform over, say, like CloudFormation, which is AWS's um, version of infrastructure as code? Well, we didn't want to be coupled to our um, cloud provider, and we, we wanted to be able to put any provider into Terraform. And this becomes important uh, later. And so our second thing that we needed was we knew we needed 100% immutable infrastructure as well. We were tired of doing security patches, and if problems arise, having to deal with the box, we just wanted to kill it and spin up a new one. And so our truly amazing team was able to accomplish this in just six months. And so on the day that we went to uh, roll it to production, which you can see this picture, it was 6 a.m. on a Saturday, and with the single click of a button, we were able to roll 17 years worth of code and infrastructure flawlessly. And so we actually had zero production issues uh, that day. So it was pretty amazing and kind of shows the power of that automated infrastructure, but it comes with some challenges. And so we're gonna talk about six of those challenges today. So I'm gonna start with DevOps as a bottleneck, which kind of doesn't make much sense because typically DevOps is a concept. With investment, we actually have a team called DevOps. And so with that, we have all these engineering teams that own the UI and the API. And DevOps owns the infrastructure, the deployment, and all of the other things that kind of fall under that DevOps bucket. So as you can see, this causes a massive bottleneck where all of these teams are submitting tickets to DevOps. It also is a huge time waste. Uh, because now we have to go have priority meetings to figure out which, which team is the highest priority and what the DevOps should, team should work on first. And so how do we solve this? Well, as I mentioned before, we now have Terraform for infrastructure as code. And so Terraform just becomes another tool on the belt of your full stack engineers. And so with that, now we're able to uh, scale and those teams are able to deliver value to our clients faster um, and in their priority order, not everyone else's. Also, it empowers our engineering teams because you have to think about this, now you have any level engineer writing infrastructure and owning their UI, uh, API, and all the infrastructure that comes along with it. So that's how we kind of spread DevOps as a culture at investment. And so the next challenge that we ran into, we like to call Project Llama, which you may notice is spelled incorrectly. And so, this is not just an engineering typo, normally it would be. We actually spell llama with two M's and one L because it stands for logging, alerting, monitors, metrics, and APM, application performance monitoring. And we had a, we had a, a solution for this, but it was kind of piecemealed and all over the place. So we had Elma, and if you haven't heard of that, it's an open source, um, .NET ASP unhandled exception logger, which actually ended up becoming the logger for our entire system, and it's persisted to SQL. At least that's where we were persisting it. And we had status cake for our uptime APIs, and we had Datadog for our monitors and metrics, and we had New Relic for APM, and all of this was alerting through emails, 
And so we knew we wanted a one-stop shop for all of Llama. And so we compared a lot of different uh, solutions and we landed on Datadog. And then for, the, for alerting, we swapped from emails over to uh, Slack channels. And so now that we have the tool, we need to figure out who manages, who owns it. And so it turns out Datadog has a Terraform provider. And so now our individual engineering teams can own that full slice vertical and have a definition of done for their microservices. And they can actually code all of Llama alongside of their infrastructure, which means it's now code reviewed uh, and uh, tested. And so another thing that we did, we like to stay on immutable, so we made Datadog immutable. All of the upper environments in Datadog are read only, and the only way to get code out there, or to get any of the resources for Datadog out there, is to use Terraform and deploy it. And so let's take a look kind of what a provider looks like in Terraform. And so here's an AWS provider and a Datadog provider. It's quite simple to get up and running in a few lines of code. Once I have that provider, I then have access to any resource within it. So in this example, I've got a synthetic API call, which is actually what replaced status cake. And it's just a simple health check with a few assertions. But you can see how easy it is to deploy this. But one thing you may notice is I keep saying the word resources. But the code says module. And that brings us to our next challenge, which was modularity. And I'll invite Steve up here to kind of talk you through that one. All right. Thanks, Curtis. So as Curtis mentioned, my name's Steve Mastrocco. I'm one of the architects at eVestment. And there, my primary role is to help evangelize and be an advocate for the adoption of some of the DevOps practices we've been talking about. So, <clears throat> one of the first problems we run into once we make infrastructure code is the same problem we run into with any code base. We find ourselves repeating the same code over and over. So we can take advantage of some of the things Terraform offers us in the form of modules. So here's a very simple example of what that looks like. It's just a simple module that creates an AWS tag schema for the developer. So this is powerful because, number one, we use tags like a lot of you probably do for cost and billing. Uh, we also use it for attribution, and we use it to populate tags within Datadog. This way, the developer doesn't have to remember what are all the things I need to tag all my resources with. They simply call this module. They provide three things about their app, the name of it, what the name of the service is. Some of this is investment specific. But we hand back them a map of the current tag schema. They then just apply that to all their resources without having to think about what are all the things I need to do. And the second thing we found ourselves typing over and over again is the pipeline. So if you've used Terraform, and just by show of hands, how many of y'all in the room are using Terraform in production today? Great, so a lot of you guys are probably very familiar with this, may even be ahead of where we're at. So the plan and apply uh, Terraform can obviously be repetitive, and it's also a little bit nuanced. If you're using remote states, there's a lot of arguments you may have to pass in about where the S3, in our case, S3 bucket is, what's the DynamoDB using for locking, what's the workspace I should be in. Instead, the developer could just consume a Jenkins shared library we've written and provide four things. The first is, what's the path to their Terraform configuration? What's the workspace or environment they're deploying to? Who's allowed to approve it? And what's the Slack channel we should send approvals to? So I'll touch more on that later, but this is important because the developer may want to in inject a human gate before they go to production or any environment if they're not yet comfortable with the Terraform pipeline. And this allows them to do so. So that one's pretty straightforward and gets our developers up and running quickly with a bunch of functionality and boilerplate stuff they don't have to worry about. But the second one is kind of a unique problem to Terraform, and that's the local development experience. So with a normal code base, you sort of have isolation, right, just by virtue of being on one laptop versus another laptop. And developer A and developer B don't really have to worry about colliding with each other. But with Terraform, that's a little bit different. When you're using a remote state like S3, the default behavior of Terraform is to drop you into the default workspace. And this leads to a situation where developer A and developer B are gonna clobber each other, potentially deleting each other's resources and so forth. 
So Terraform provides a very easy mechanism to get out of this, which is Terraform workspaces. But it presents a new challenge. Now, every time the developer starts working, they have to remember, I got to make a workspace. What's my workspace name I made? I, not, I need to not make a workspace that collides with another workspace that developer B made. So we just mask this all behind a simple CLI wrapper that we wrote in PowerShell. So it's PowerShell core, uh, which makes it cross-platform. We have developers on Mac and Windows, and of course our pipelines in Linux. Uh, and they kind of get this for free. So you'll see an example usage of this. They just simply call it, provide the directory that their Terraform lives in, and they automatically down here start getting for free a workspace that matches their Git branch name. So this is a really nice way because Git branches by definition are unique. And we find that when developer A and developer B are working on the same microservice, they're typically not working, in our case, on the same ticket or card. So they don't really collide with each other. So it kind of creates a situation where they don't have to think about this, they just get this for free and run this CLI wrapper. This is just this in, it, uh, in uh, demoing it for you here. I can show that I'm in a workspace that matches my Git branch name. And down here, I can see I consumed the AWS module tag. I automatically, for free, got tags that align to my Datadog environment, my Terraform workspace. And this makes it really easy for a developer to just search in AWS for anything that's matching their branch name and find their resources quickly. So the next problem we talked about here, or going to talk about here, isn't really a problem. It's more of an opportunity that came out of doing infrastructure as code. So like any code base, we would write tests to make sure any assertions that we uh, have about our code aren't breaking every time we make changes. Now that our infrastructure is code, we can just do the same thing. So here's a very simple example of a module being consumed. It's just a Route 53 module being used in two different ways. I'm making a public and private record across our Split Horizon DNS, and I'm just making a private record for maybe our private APIs that shouldn't be exposed to the world. This is an example of those tests or assertions. So we use the Terraform Kitchen provider for Test Kitchen. So Test Kitchen, if you're not familiar with it, was born out of the Chef community, and it follows a very simple uh, run. It's a test harness that goes create, converge, verify, and destroy. So in this case, the create and converge phase are loosely aligned to a Terraform plan and a Terraform apply. The verify step would traditionally run in a test suite called inspect. Uh, when we started this journey, the InSpec AWS resources weren't that mature and they, they were lacking in some areas. They're very good now, but because of that, we went with a community uh, open source solution called AWS Spec. If you've seen InSpec, it looks exactly like InSpec. Uh, and if you haven't seen InSpec, it looks exactly like any other unit testing framework you may be familiar with. We make simple assertions about describe Route 53 host. It should exist. It should have this name. It should have these records with these properties. So once I've done that, the developer in the pipeline simply gets immediate feedback about any change they've made infrastructure-wise and if it broke any assertions that still be true. This, <clears throat> excuse me. This is just an example of one passing test. But you can see where this is going. <clears throat> so now that the developer can get up and running very quickly using modules and not having to think about boilerplate, they've got an easy local development work experience without having to think about how do I isolate myself. They can get immediate feedback from their pipeline to know that the infrastructure change is working and tested. Now they're ready to deploy. So we need a deployment pipeline. So this is where the Jenkins shared library comes back into play. I'm going to go through what our Jenkins pipeline looks like and kind of talk about it a little bit more. So the first thing we do, of course, is we run the Jenkins shared library and the Terraform deployment. This is actually also our application deployment. Because we're using containers and ECS is our scheduler, Part of the Terraform is, of course, the task definition and the service. And we just take advantage of Terraform, create before destroy, to kind of manage creating the old, new resource before destroying the old one. Once we're done with that, the infrastructure's up and running, and ECS takes over the deployment, doing the rolling upgrade that it does, waiting for ALB health checks to pass before destroying the old one. So here we just call the AWS CLI, uh, using a tool they have within that called wait for stable. Once that's done, we have confidence that our API is up and running and passing our ALB health checks. We're ready to deploy the front end. So Curtis mentioned we're using Vue, and Vue CLI under the hood is just using Webpack. So the result of this is just all our chunked out uh, JavaScript files, which are very nice to be just hosted in S3. We throw CloudFront in front of that as a CDN, and we're good to go. 
Lastly, we deploy the Datadog dashboard that the team may use to monitor their four golden signals or whatever they're wanting to look at. So this might seem a little bit uh, contradictory to what Curtis was mentioning before, which is all of our Datadog stuff is Terraform, and why wasn't this deployed in step one? Well, the teams found that dashboards specifically in the Datadog provider are very difficult to rationalize and write. You're basically designing a UI in t declarative language of HCL, and it wasn't that great of an experience. So what the teams found was a little bit better was in our lower environments, they have write access. So they simply log into the lower environment, dev in this case, create a dashboard and drag and drop how they want it to look, and export that dashboard as JSON. That JSON just then lives along their Terraform code, their view code, and their API code, and then of course is deployed through the Datadog API in the pipeline. So we're still achieving the same goal, which is it's still code, it still goes through a, a, pure, a pull request pr process, and it's still deployed in a repeatable way that gives us confidence that it's working. So that's our pipeline, and I'm just gonna dive into one more thing real quick, which is our shared library and the human gate I mentioned. So when teams first come on, or in perpetuity, they may want a human gate before Terraform deployments happen in production. It sounds like a lot of you guys are using Terraform, and you can probably know it has a lot of nuances, and sometimes plans don't look like you expect them to. So we create TFRs per environment. You can see here I'm looking at the testing one, and I, if you can't read it in the back, this little comment says skip human approval. So when our shared library is going through the deployment, it simply looks for this in the TFR file, and if it finds it, it goes directly from the plan and apply phase without any kind of human intervention. But if, it does find, uh, if it's omitted, and many times teams do that in production, they end up getting a Slack notification that looks like this. So it points them at, what's a link to the Jenkins plan that I can review, what environment or workspace is it for, and who's allowed to approve or reject it. All of that was coming back from the shared library. They pass that in when they call it. So all of these have enabled our teams to start delivering value really fast. We're probably not at the, some of the scale you guys are at, and we're definitely not at Google scale. So to give you guys kind of an idea of where we're at, we have roughly 80 engineers currently that are writing code every day. And since January 1st, so about the last seven months, those teams have been able to spin up roughly 60 microservices, and they've done over 1,800 infrastructure deployments using this Terraform pipeline. And lastly, because they're not having to think about how to do all that anymore, they've been able to make over 11,000 merges to master in their application code repos. And that's really valuable for us because every merge here is a deployment for us. So the business is getting the value they want faster and faster, while we still have confidence that everything's being deployed and monitored. So we've done all this and still achieved nearly a four nines uptime right now, which is exceeding you know, our businesses, SLOs, and things like that. So I'll close out with this is our contact information. Feel free to reach out to us with any questions after this. And I think if there's time, Curtis and I are open to taking questions. Thanks.